Afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for coming along to the session this afternoon. Lights are very bright, so please excuse me if I uh, look down a little bit and uh, and uh, sort of look, you know, show you the top of my head where the hair is sort of disappearing. So uh, today, what we're going to talk about is uh, is the fact that these days, when we release mainframe products, we release them into what we call the dynamic data center. So we're not talking about just the mainframe anymore. Everybody has a data center that consists of a large number of different platforms, and uh, the mainframe uh, runs workloads that are suited to that platform, and uh, other, other uh, platforms will run other workloads depending on the, uh, on the circumstances. So we don't just release products anymore for the mainframe. We're focusing on releasing products that work with the mainframe and also other aspects of what we call your dynamic data center. So today I have with me uh, Alex and uh, Oliver from, from Amazon Web Services and Riverbed, who we're partnering with to, uh, in the release of our latest uh, mainframe product here, uh, which is CA Cloud Storage for System Z. So the Dynamic Data Center, what is it? Why do we do it? How do we do it? Uh, what we're talking about here is, uh, is a, a data center where uh, a mainframe may be present and other, lots of other platforms such as servers and clouds and all those sorts of other things are also present. And the, the workloads that run on the mainframe are, are uniquely designed to run there. And uh, workloads that run in the cloud are, are, are well suited to, to running there. And workloads that run on servers and other types of infrastructure are well su suited to running there. And what CA is doing with, them, <coughs> with their mainframe product releases at, uh, in the future is to try and release products that are applicable to that whole spectrum of, of the data center. So that's the context of, of, of this product. So uh, we only have 30 minutes today. It's quite a short period, and we're going to have a, uh, a, a panel for, for questions afterwards. So I'm going to try and skip through these slides fairly quickly so that we can get to, to, to the questions. So storage demand continues to increase all the time. That's, that's a fairly obvious sort of a statement. It uh, doesn't increase as much on the mainframe as it used to, but it does still continue to increase. And uh, all the, the mainframe data is traditionally stored on, on your EMC, IBM, Hitachi type devices, uh, which are suited to the mainframe in that they have large amounts of cache, they have enormous redundancy, and they're very, very fast. And uh, so they're serving things up in sort of one millisecond for each I.O. and things like that. And they're designed to do back-end uh, transaction processing for large banking systems and federal government and things of that nature. Now, what, what still happens is that we're storing all data, regardless of what kind of data it is, we're storing it on that same, same type of storage device. So we might be storing it in, in, a, in an IBM virtual tape server or some of these large uh, redundant arrays that I've, that I've already mentioned. But there is some, some data that doesn't really need to be stored in such a high performance environment. Some of that may be backup, some of it may be archive, some of it may be stuff that you want to do for reruns. Um, I've, I've heard that there's a lot of transaction logs for internet banking that gets stored there that may never need to be used again. And so we're still spending money and sizing our environment for all of this extra data when a lot of it doesn't need to be stored in such a high performance environment. So we end up with, with some high costs for, for a, a proportion of our data, which, which uh, it would be nice to avoid. <coughs> uh, when we look at the, the cost of data, we can look at the TCO, the total cost of operation around things like air conditioning and, and uh, electricity and power and cooling. The capital expenditure to buy 800 terabytes of storage, for example, versus somewhat less than that and how often we have to replace that storage when the maintenance contracts run out and things of that nature. And if we're in a service provider environment, which many of us are on the mainframe these days, uh, we, we may have a, a cents per terabyte type of cost or cents per gigabyte type of cost that we're being charged by the service provider that's applying to all of the data regardless of the kind of performance and availability that we require of, of that data. So, so those costs can be quite quite high. And the bottom line is, is, is what sort of data could we take out of that equation and store it in the cloud? Because these days we have Amazon Web Services uh, providing us with storage for one, one cent per gigabyte per month. 
and storage that's that's a fairly high performance form of storage is, is being provided to us for three cents per gigabyte per month. And so, uh, so that's the, the challenges and, and, and some of the things we, we should be thinking about there. So this is what a traditional uh, mainframe storage configuration looks like, where we have the various mainframe systems connecting into some virtualization of the tape drives. Those tape drives are then mounted and uh, data is written at disk access speeds to, to a tape robotic device from Oracle Sun Storage Tech or to an IBM tape virtualization server of some kind, um, as well as being written to traditional DASD. And then we will replicate that information across to our disaster recovery site where we duplicate that infrastructure, that high cost infrastructure. So if you can reduce the cost associated with that infrastructure, then you get a bit of a double whammy in that you can reduce those costs at the primary site and also at the secondary site in many cases. So that's what a traditional storage configuration looks like in, in the mainframe environment. So at Amazon reInvent in 2013, we got together with Riverbed Technology and Amazon and we announced the CA Cloud Storage for System Z product uh, where we, we put a riverbed appliance in between the mainframe and the Amazon cloud and we identify storage that's uh, eligible to go to the cloud and uh, we move it there using, uh, using uh, all of the uh, software from CA, software and hardware from riverbed and the Amazon service. <clears throat> and under that scenario we have a, 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 a situation that looks like this where we have the virtual drives we have a channel-to-channel -channel connection to a Linux system where we have a riverbed steel store device mounted. And the, when you mount a, a virtual tape drive on the mainframe, that corresponds to a mount point over on the riverbed device. And uh, we'll mount that via a very fast channel-to-channel -channel connection on Linux and transfer the data across. The data will then be encrypted, deduplicated and compressed and moved to the uh, Amazon cloud, either using the Glacier service, which is a sort of a one cent per gigabyte per month service with a four to five hour recovery time objective, or to a, an Amazon S3 uh, simple storage service, which is, has a much faster uh, performance, and uh, that costs about three cents per gigabyte per month. Way, way less than what your service providers are probably costing your, your, your storage at the moment. So the information is extremely secure and it's encrypted, deduplicated and compressed. Now our previous presenter was, was presenting on, on how easy it is to, to get stuck into decry to decrypting data, but in this case we have deduplication, compression and deduplication algorithms involved and uh, we have that data being moved through, uh, through devices to the cloud uh, deduplicated in line. It's a, it's a moving target. It's a much, much different ball game to try and intercept that moving target data and somehow knock the microphone off and, uh, and uh, do anything with it. So, so it's a very, very secure, secure connection. <coughs> and, and CA virtualizes the tape environment on the mainframe side and uh, inter, in, inter, integrates with DFSMS. So you set up a thing such as a data class and the DFSMS data class that's identified as being your cloud storage data class will, will identify the data that's, a, that's, that's destined for the riverbed and uh, that data will then uh, be mounted on the riverbed and transferred there via, via Linux. If you don't want to use a SMS data class, you can just use data set name patterns and uh, identify your data uh, by patterns to, to, to move that data to the cloud. Uh, once the riverbed gets a hold of it, it will compress, deduplicate, encrypt it, and do all of that in line, and it will transfer the information to AWS. You can have a, a riverbed device that is a virtual device, or you can have a physical appliance, whatever you choose. And you can also, if you want to, pin some of that data locally inside the riverbed device if it's the kind of data that you may want to get back in a hurry, if you need to. So you can keep it on site. Um, if, if that's what you would like to do. And you could also, uh, if you want to, have a disaster recovery copy of the riverbed device in another site and have a warm disaster recovery environment as well. So there's a lot of flexibility there, which, uh, which, the, which Oliver can talk about later if, uh, when we get to questions. 
So I'm going to try and get to questions pretty quickly here. Um, on the Amazon Web Services side of things, um, we, they, they provide 11 nines reliability for the, for the storage by storing the data locally here in Australia across three data centres. So the information is replicated across three data centres and uh, you're getting all of that for one to three cents per gigabyte per month, which is enormously cheap compared to the, to the uh, prices that we're, we're paying for mainframe storage these days. Uh, the S3 system is faster than the Glacier system, but uh, you can choose which one you use, and Amazon will move the data between the two in the background, depending on, on least recently used type of considerations and, and things of that nature. So it depends on what your recovery time objective is for, for the information. So how do I, how, what, what sort of hardware do you need for this? You need uh, at least two FICON CTC channel to channel addresses in your mainframe, but everybody will probably have that. Four, of, four is better if you want to have uh, some additional three, throughput and availability for redundancy and things like that. You need to have um, a 10 gigabyte OSA adapter. You can run it with a 1 gig adapter, but a 10 gigabyte OSA adapter is probably uh, what you would need to get the kind of throughput that you want for some of these larger, larger installations, such as banks and federal government. And, and you need a, uh, a riverbed steel store device. And uh, it can either be a physical or a virtual device. Uh, this is what it uh, kind of looks like. Uh, you can see there that the, uh, the uh, Amazon S3 service is connected to this particular riverbed. We're getting 11.4 times deduplication. And that's another aspect of this is that you get enormous amounts of compression and deduplication. Usually with mainframe data, we're seeing five or six to one at least. And so you, you can sort of store a, a terabyte of data on maybe on maybe 150 terabytes of, sorry, 150 gigabytes of, uh, of, of appliance, which, uh, <coughs> which can be stored in the size of a couple of pizza boxes. And I keep hitting that microphone. <laughs> sorry about that. Just trying to make sure you're awake. So, so uh, it's, a, it's a very, very efficient storage medium. This is what we're trying to do is make, make storage that's, that's appropriate for this kind of storage kind of uh, approach to be stored extremely efficiently and extremely cheaply and extremely securely. <clears throat> Software, you need, obviously you're running IBM ZOS on your mainframe if you're, uh, if you're doing this. You need the CA Cloud Storage for System Z product with the current maintenance, SUSE Linux on your, on your Linux on Z and you can run that under ZVM or you can run it without ZVM if, if you really need to. So the key benefits of this are to, to allow you to have an elastic kind of a storage situation where you can get as much storage as you want in the cloud without having to plan for it in advance. And uh, you can reduce your dependency on the expensive duplicated, replicated, proprietary one millisecond high cache, massively redundant systems that you're using for the mainframe. So you can reduce the costs and dependency associated with that. And then when you're doing your sizing for your acquisitions of new storage in the future, you can, you can size your environment more appropriately, not buy as much, not pay as much power cooling and, and uh, management overhead to migrate data and things like that to, to, to move new boxes in and all the other costs that are associated with managing, managing storage. So this session was just intended to be a high level, quick summary. Nobody gets a chance to go to sleep in here. We'll have a, a 10 minute uh, question time now um, where you can ask some more questions about what interests you about this solution. And I'll have Oliver Bassett and Alex Nemeth de Bacal from uh, Riverbed and Amazon Web Services respectively will come up on stage. We'll sit here and, uh, and uh, look at you for a few more minutes and hopefully uh, you can think of a question to ask us. Yeah, it's stored in the country. Should have asked, let, let you answer that, yeah, Alex. No. Uh, great question. So. Uh, with our S3 service and our Glacier service, where you store the data, the data store, stays in that location. So to answer your, your question directly, uh, if you store within S3 or Glacier within the Australia region, it stays within Australia. A lot of work with the financial services sector, 
data sovereignty, uh, federal and state government as well, uh, always a subject that we, we, we talk about and, and luckily with the local facilities the answer is yes. Uh, so yes, we have a, a reasonably large customer base um, throughout uh, Australia and actually internationally as well. So uh, we've got a number of different sort of reference cases. Um, some of the more high profile customers would be um, NASDAQ in the US are using the solution. Um, and uh, Rico in Japan. Uh, so th there's a number of, of kind of large customers out there. So it's, it's pretty widely deployed uh, in the open system space. Yeah, I'll just touch on, on, on cloud, storage, cloud storage as a whole if I can. Um, yeah, at the start of this year, with, with, this, with the greatest respect to any storage experts here, storage probably wasn't my favorite subject. Uh, and uh, it, it was one that, that really didn't excite me. Uh, we did a project with a very large financial services customer at the start of the year, which was looking at storage and, and not the technical elements. That was important. So we had the security discussions, the data sovereignty discussions. We went through the capability process. Um, but what was really important was the, the value that we were delivering this organisation. When we went through the cost analysis for a single petabyte of data, the, the cost savings was in the multi-millions of dollars per year. Uh, and when we started looking at these figures, uh, it really became a, a no-brainer. And for me personally, that was a little epiphany. It was a Yahoo moment that said, every customer needs to be looking at this. Now, uh, every customer has different requirements. Uh, you know, there, there's different workloads. But the cost savings are, are so significant uh, that, that that by itself becomes a great opportunity to deliver value back to the organisation.